Hey, what's up, everyone, and welcome back to this week's Weekly D, where I have the amazing Sergio Louise come on and talk to me about all things pole dancing. We talk about what it was like for her to have a baby just before the pandemic, and we talk about her journey back from giving birth to today and being amazing on the pole. She talks to us super honestly, and I love that because so much within poll we talk about pregnancy and you hear about people bouncing back and Sergio was super honest about her journey back to poll and how things really aren't the same but I'm not going to spoil too much for you I want you to listen to it yourself and experience this we talk about all sorts of different things so I'm really excited for you to listen to this episode so without further ado this is the weekly d because honey if you ain't getting your d on the daily you better at least be getting it once on the weekly If you're not getting any, if you want some tea, then come and join them up on the Weekly D. It's the Weekly D. Sergio, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. I'm super excited to chat with you today. I've been very much looking forward to this. Oh, thank you. I, I want to get this out of the way, first of all, because I know I say it wrong. I say it in a British accent. We say Sergio, which I know is completely incorrect. Do you say Sergio? So it's like it's, a, not the G. Is it Sergio? Or? It's it's either Sergio or Sergio. Um, and most of my students call me Serge. <laughs> Oh, they call you Serge? That's yeah. amazing. And is it a Spanish? Where, where does this, this name come from? Is it a Spanish name? It's Spanish in origin, but it's Filipino. So I'm oh, half, okay. yeah, I'm half Filipino. Half Filipino. And what's the other half? Where's your um, other family member from? Yeah, my dad is like German, Swedish, English. So um, yeah, so my mom's Do you mom's speak Filipino. any German? No, I wish. No, no, I so do I. It's really funny. I, I spend so much of my time in Germany that I always say, "Oh, I wish I didn't have to be German." We um, we in the UK, we we just don't push languages here at all, like upon mm. the kids, like so because we know that everywhere we go, it's the same for the US, I guess. Everywhere we go, someone speaks English, right? So we just get to be really lazy when it comes to I languages. Agree. I agree. I agree. I was always terrible. used to joking when I was like when I was touring. You know, I, I have some Spanish, so I can get by with Spanish when I'm teaching. And I'll tell you, my ballet background came really in handy in French-speaking countries because all they would do was speak ballet, and they would understand what I was saying because all the ballet terms are in French. So right. somehow I would get away with, you know, being able to, to you know, rond de jambe and saute. And, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So tell, tell me about that then. In fact, in fact, actually, before you tell me about the ballet background, I always like to get people at the beginning of the podcast just to tell us a little about who they are, what they do, um, and just so people can get an idea of who Sergio is so that they can go into this with like a fresh mind of what you do and who you are. So yeah. let's hear it. What, what, tell us a bit about you. This is always hard when you do it about yourself, but like, let it me see. Hard. Who am I today? Who, let's start with that. Who am I today? <laughs> I'm a mom. I'm a pole studio owner. Um, I live up in Northern California. I'm the founder of the Vertitude Studios. Um, I uh, was a pole competitor way back in the day in the 2012-2013 era. Um, spent about six years touring. Um, and then moved up to Northern California to have my daughter. Um, I am a total nerd for pole performance. My background is um, is theater and dance. I have a BFA in drama from Tisch School of the Arts, New York City. So I spent about eight years out in New York working, and another eight years in LA working before I decided to move back to the country because I didn't want to have it. I didn't want to deal with any of it. <laughs> um, but always still nerd out on being able to. Uh, share um, how to create a performance and um, how to move an audience. I think the the competition road for me was more about hanging out with my friends and telling great stories on stage. Um, right. So I did it because my friends were doing it, and you know, and um, that just became such a wonderful bonding experience that I got to have with my friends. My background is ballet, jazz, modern, contemporary. I used to compete in salsa. Um, so definitely a body nerd and a movement nerd, but also super nerding out on. Um, my whole life teaching movement in a way that is accessible to people without a dance background. So that's really me in a nutshell. Right. And wh whereabouts are you based? Where are the studios all based? And where, where, where is it in the US that you are? 
Yeah, so I'm in Northern California, Santa Rosa. I was in Los Angeles for a while, as is the Virtitude Los Angeles um, uh, that I don't uh, own anymore. Um, one of my teachers owns down in LA, and I own the Virtitude Santa Rosa up in NorCal, Northern California. Okay. So, and have you always been from there or did you originally live somewhere? Did you originally live in LA and then you moved somewhere else? Yeah. So I grew up in Santa Rosa. So I grew up here and mm -hmm. I left for college when I was 18 and stayed as far away as possible for as long as possible. <laughs> uh, so what took you back? Uh, wanting to have a family of my own and wanting to be closer to my extended family. Um, yeah, yeah, the babysitters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's so funny because I was literally just talking to one of my um, instructors the other day. She was like, well, she was like, yeah, we want to have a baby. She was like, she was like, I know it sounds stupid, but, you know, having a mom or someone who is able to look after your child is actually invaluable you don't realize how how important it is to have that and she's like we don't have anything like that where we live now because obviously we don't live anywhere near family she's like so it's like a really tough thing for them to be like mm, who's gonna where's grandma when we need grandma so oh, yeah so true. Must, oh god i can only imagine how much like it must be so hard not having any free time whatsoever i mean i can't relate because i just have dog children and they're amazing <laughs> i want them to be around me all the time <laughs> but um one of the things that actually was on the list to talk about and let's just go straight into it now since we're on the subject was mum life um when did you become a mum and how long had you been pole dancing for at the time okay let's see so i began pole dancing in 2010 ish um and my daughter was born in wait yeah that's right i was <laughs> my daughter was born in 2019 <laughs> Cause I was like, I've been bowling okay. for 19 years, but no, that's not 19 years, not 2000. Okay, yeah. so yeah, I was like, that's that. I haven't been pulling that long. No, um, so gosh, how how many years I'd have been pulling when she was born? Um, nine years, I guess, right? And how old? Um, sorry, what what month was she actually born in 2019? Out of interest. Yeah, so she was born on the summer solstice. <laughs> June right. 21st, 2019, and she is absolutely my fire baby. She is uh -huh. coming in hot. <laughs> so she so she was like one of the sort of like near the end of like the babies that were born before COVID really kicked off, right? Yes, yes. She it was got all to right experience before COVID. at least six months of normal life. That must have been nice. <laughs> oh, the <laughs> memories. The memories of her being six months and me – you know, starting to teach in the studio about four months, three, four months after she was born and having that glorious three, like, you know, three, four, five, six, three months back in the studio where I was like getting back and getting back to my community, getting back to myself, getting back to, uh, my body was starting to feel a little bit more familiar. Six months hit and everything just Fell hit the fan. Shit. Yeah, yeah it, really it was really, it was really hard because then I was home with a six month old and like just full force in from being a studio owner and a business owner to having nothing, um, right. no income, nothing to being like, you are a housewife and you have a six month year old and you are on your own. Like, good luck. Yeah. That was rough. That was not an easy time. <laughs> I mean, I want to talk, COVID is definitely actually on the subject to talk about, but before we do, I want to talk about your transition from, because it must be really, again, I can only speak from what I'm told because I've never had a baby and I would be gobsmacked if that ever happened in my lifetime because it's probably not possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's that whole thing of like, how how does you, how did you feel inside your body after you'd had the baby? How long did it take to come back? These sorts of things. Like, what was that experience like for you? Well, it's so interesting. I mean, the way that you talk about it, you know, what was your experience to come back? There has been no coming back. <laughs> right, I do, okay. You know what I mean? So the mm -hmm. way I feel is, um, and I, you know, I have, I've done things a certain way in which my life has really been, my, my life has really been put on pause because I kind of really jumped into this motherhood thing and everyone does it different. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, I'm still breastfeeding my daughter and she's almost four. So right. there is, yeah, there is, is that a, normal? I don't know. Is that um, not normal? It's, it's just everyone does it their own way. Um, uh -huh. But it's been, you know, it's been a long road. I've 
with her. I've been very attentive. We haven't really, in fact, this weekend is the first weekend I've spent three days away from her. I've never spent one day away from her. So this wow. is really a huge event in my life that really became my priority. And I absolutely struggle with the balance of making sure that I'm taken care of. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, these last four years have been a lot. It's been, you know, I was kind of well on my way back on track in many ways as we, you know, um, at about the four, five, six month mark. And then when COVID hit and I lost the studio and I lost every, my community, I lost my space. Um, we were closed for eight months. I didn't know what that was going to look like. Um, you know, my relationship fell apart. Um, you know, and then right after, you know, right after that, you know, as it was, things were starting to get back to normal, then, um, you know, we, we had kind of like a good, uh, we had to come back and find like a subleased space and did that for about a year. And then that kind of fell apart. So it's been a rocky road and I've got wow. a, I've got a, um, I've got just like an amazing, amazing, intelligent, like spitfire of a daughter and um, I have tried my best to do things as mindfully as possible. Uh, one of those things that big challenges has been to set boundaries. You know, the universe was like, so we want to teach you to learn to set boundaries. We are going to send you this little angel. And if you don't learn them, you will be destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So she is a force to reckon with for sure. Um you know, I have, I've been very mindful about wanting to make sure that, it, you know, she has the ability to voice her opinion and say no and body autonomy and all of these things. And boy, does that bite me in the ass as a mom all the time. Because <laughs> then it's like, okay, we're leaving now and it's time to put on your shoes. I don't want to put on my shoes. No, runs right. the other direction. And I'm like, Huh? I have part. Damn it! This, yeah. I have part. I have been a part in this. I believe. I caused this. I created <laughs> yes. this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I take full responsibility for. You know, she has no problem telling you what she wants and does not want at any time. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of look at her and I go, "Wow, I'm trying. I'm still trying to learn that at 41." <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're 41. Yeah. Oh my god! I yeah. thought you were my age. I thought you were like thirty-four. <laughs> I don't know why I thought you were the similar age to me. Oh, well, well, thank you. Look, you. you look amazing. Um, thank you. So, and what's it? How is it um, going from co-parenting to obviously having to parent on your own? I assume she's with you full time, right? So, how is how is that transition? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm really, really lucky. My co-parenting situation is is as about as good as it can get. Okay, um, that's good. So it's you guys get you along know, still. Yeah, yeah, that's and really I think good. it's I'm I'm really really lucky, and um, we're both really really dedicated to her experience and making sure that you know she has a family. You know, mm -hmm. um, so but I, but you know it. There's a lot of there's a lot of ups and downs. You know, this with the studio as well. I mean, I I did return to teaching, um, but as far as you're saying, like, how is it coming back? You know, as far as being a studio owner, and I'm, and I'm sure you've had this conversation with many studio owners, what it's like to be a studio owner is very different than what it's like to be a teacher, than very yeah. different than what it's like to be just a touring artist or even, um, you know, a student training. Um, you know, I'm mama bear, you know, so everyone yeah. gets taken care of before me. So it's really about, you know, is my, is my daughter good? Are my students good? Are they okay? How are they doing? Are they getting what they need? And then last is here. So I still really struggle with that. But mm -hmm. I think that as she's getting older and she's becoming a kid, you know, she'll right. be four um, in June. As she's getting a little bit older, I'm starting to kind of reacquaint um, myself with myself. But there has not been a lot of training for me. Yes, right. have I been able to be in a certain amount of shape to do the teaching that I do? Like teaching has always been there, you know. Um, I was starting to teach at about three months postpartum, um, but then COVID hit at about six months. So I had, had about three months of teaching. Then I had about an eight month, eight month break from mm. teaching. Right. And then coming back into teaching and luckily, um, the teaching has been great. Cause I teach a lot of 
you know, um, a lot of basics. And I think that really helped to be teaching all those basics because that was really getting me back to moving my body on both sides and doing everything on both sides. And, um, I really just used a lot of that teaching time to try to reconnect to my breath and try to reconnect to my body. So there has not been a ton of time for me to do that by myself, but I do my best, um, Mm. you know, to do it through my teaching. I'm just now starting, I have like a, a weekly pole jam that I do with one of my teachers who is also, she's a mom of three who homeschools. Wow. Mm. Amazing. (laughs) And we have that time. We have that two hours a week where we meet up and you know what? Sometimes I think we do download with Dan. (laughs) Yes, that's right. Actually, it's been lovely. One of my private students came to me and was like, I want to do this challenge. I was like, Oh, okay, we'll do this for you. And then everyone kind of hopped on board and I was everyone like, you know wants what? To do it. I, and I was like, I should be doing this too. I'm teaching you all the, like we're making sure that you can do all these moves. Elizabeth, she was just obsessed. It was all her, you know? <laughs> and so we just kind I of like, that. yeah, so it was inspiring and it's been wonderful for me too. Cause it's, it's, it's been the, great the, watching you do it. Like obviously <laughs> for me, you know, you're one of the names that as I, I wouldn't say grew up with because that makes it sound like I was a child <laughs> when I started doing pole dance. But you know what? Like when I when I was in the industry, like in the first however many years, like you were one of the bigger names as well. And like so, it, and it's nice to see you getting back. And now after like having your child and stuff, and doing these challenges and stuff, it was really nice to see you like back on the pole and stuff because it's I wonderful. felt like. Um, and again, I hope this isn't offensive in saying this, but obviously when you had your child, I felt like you disappeared quite a bit. And now I feel like I'm seeing you again and you're showing up on my timeline again. Yeah. And, um, it's just really now. I mean, of four, four years later, I mean, it's different, that's the reality right? of it. <laughs> and how do you feel in, so I don't know how to word this. How do you feel? How does your body feel doing pole now, as opposed to how it did pre baby? And what, I guess when I say that, like, do you notice anything like, do you injure easier or do you feel like your straddle feels different because your pelvis has moved or anything like this, any stuff that just feels really different? You're like, mm, this doesn't feel as good as it used to. Yeah, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Okay. Nothing, nothing feels the same. Okay. So anyone, <laughs> I hope I'm not thinking, scaring people. <laughs> anyone thinking of having a baby right now is like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's good for people to know the reality of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I feel like it really all depends on many factors too. What kind of support system do you have? Um, do you have the time to train? Are you maybe not a studio owner? I mean, being a studio owner and a mom, you know, being a studio owner and a single mom and, um, deciding to run events. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's a lot, right. And I, I mean, I think if I was just a student, I would definitely be at a different place than I am now with my right. own personal polling. The other thing that, you, you know, that's something to really take into account is that I still, since I'm still breastfeeding and many people, you know, um, don't breastfeed at all. And many people, and, you know, everyone does it their own way, you know, as long, you know, it, and, and, and there's no, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, but What's really interesting for me is that the hormones that are there because I'm still breastfeeding, they, they still have me in a space where my body feels quite foreign. So for example, there was a lot of, um, uh, to be very specific, you know, uh, when you're in a cupid on the pole and you're, you've uh-huh. got a lot of like inner thigh adduction work that's yes. happening. Uh-huh. That kind of work on my body does not work anymore. <laughs> and I'm not saying that it won't come back, but it's not even that it's hard. It's that's it's gone. <laughs> it's, right. Can I ask you ask a question about that? And again, this comes from a place of not knowing. So I, again, I hope this isn't wrong in saying, you know, like when people, I always get told from people that uh, flexibility is so easy when when they're pregnant because the hips are opening their muscles are relaxed and because you're breastfeeding yeah. now is that the kind of same thing your body is doing like is it keeping the muscles relaxed in that sense is it the same hormones as when you're leading up to having birth as afterwards so i don't know how it works 
Yeah, yeah. So there is some relaxin still in the body when you're breastfeeding. And do you think, think that's what's stopping you doing the cupid? Like there, it's like yes. right, your muscles are just just not wanting to turn on. They're yeah. too they're too relaxed. Yeah, it's really yes, yes, absolutely. And you know, I think, um, but everyone's different. I, I I definitely feel I'm I'm kind of nerded out about this whole process because yeah, some people think okay, well I have the relax and I can really stretch a lot. I think I'm slightly hypermobile in certain parts of my body to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I think that has worked in the opposite for me because my body has yeah. said, yeah, instead of being like, oh, it's okay, we can relax. It has been, you're in danger, so tighten it up. <laughs> right. Right. So, you know, so it's very much like, I think that um, a lot of, you know, there's like literally a mind body connection with my mm. adductors that is not firing where okay. I can't, I can't, eat, I'm like, I try to tap almost with my hand to be like, Hey, 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 you know, like right. to see if those muscles are there. Um, but yeah, I do believe that it stems from like that relaxin. I had really intense pubic symphysis during my pregnancy, which is just where the, um, like the whole pelvis is kind of pulling apart and it creates a lot of, um, uh, just wreak some havoc on the sacrum and the bones are kind of some more spread out and they're not really kind of fusing back together as they should. And I feel did like you, it's taking my body a long time. Did you have to wear one of those time. belt things that has yes. to like, oh, you did. I've heard yes, about it. So is that what that's called? Cause I remember a student had told me she'd come back from pregnancy and basically her, she had to wear this like belt almost like hold her hips together. Like whilst they Correct. were trying, yeah, she has to do loads of physio and stuff for that. Yeah, like your bones are, they have been completely mo moved. So holding that belt just kind of holds everything together so you don't have a ton of pain um, right. around your like your pubic bone, even walking or standing on one foot. And I have, even though it's not as bad as it was when I was pregnant, I still have, rem you know, um, trouble, you know, uh, like little, little glimpses of that that come into my training were standing on one foot or changing direction quickly mm. or doing a cupid where not everything is firing and I try to be very you know definitely get down on myself time sometimes but you know what like I decided that I decided she was going to be the priority so I can't have my cake and eat it too right right so I just have to take a deep breath and say you know what my body is foreign right now it has been foreign it has changed many times throughout this process and who the heck knows what's going to happen when I stop breastfeeding? I should be open and excited about the idea that maybe that's when some familiarity does start to come back. And, and you know, again, not to scare people, but um, just giving myself grace that, like, this is a season. It has been a long season. It has been a four-year season. And then before mm. that, five years because of pregnancy. But I, you know, I'm not concerned. Pole is not going anywhere. I love pole. Pole mm -hmm. is such a huge love of mine. I love sharing it. It's not my turn right now to be this, you know, on the stage. It's my turn to be the guide, the guide on the slide for all the, um, for, you know, all the students and the teachers. Right. Um, and, you know, and I know that as she gets older and when I stop breastfeeding, that there's going to be some changes that I have no idea what's going to happen. So I'm just trying to be patient with myself and patient with my body um, I mean, I'm absolutely not this. It's so strange. And I know a lot of people can relate to this And even people who didn't, ha you know, don't have babies, but are coming back from the pandemic and something to remember is in my brain and in my body, in my mind, there are things that I can do because I've done them a thousand times right. on the pole and you get up there and it, I just laugh at myself because I come down, I'm like, Serge, you think you can do these things, but you can't. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> you start to go through a very um, familiar pattern. You're like, oh, yeah, I do this combo wall, though. Woo, I'm heavy. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was heavy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. So it's, it is definitely, and I know, again, it's not just for people, um, you know, who have had babies, but also for everyone with the right. changes that they're in the seasons that their body go through and to give yourself grace. We're not meant to be at the top of our game for our whole life. And right? how, how does that, uh, I'm intrigued to ask because I know how it affects me because during the pandemic, my body gained weight and I've definitely found it really hard to get out of some habits. And I've kind of just accepted that 
this is kind of my the way I'm at now is kind of like the way that I kind of sit at quite comfortably and I can lose weight if I want to but gain weight is super easy um how does that affect your mental health because like you said when you're doing these moves and you're like oh yeah I can do this I do it all the time and then you can't what does that do to you because it really messes with me a little bit oh yeah I mean come on it messes with everyone um you know I I do my best to just kind of have, you know, I, I try to think about what I would tell a student. I try to think about what I would tell my daughter. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. I try to think I, I do my best and it's not always easy because we, our self-talk is a lot different than how we tend to treat our friends and our students and our loved right. ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really do try to turn it on myself. Like it's not, you know, this is right now. This is okay. And you know what? It really does help me that my whole pole journey um, you know, starting way back in 2010, like I was never even ever to begin with one of those pullers who needed to have everything. Right. Even when I was at the top of my game and something that I like to, you know, remind my students and, and this comes, you know, back to performance as well is that, you know, when you go on stage and you perform something, no one is thinking about what you're not doing. Right. They're only watching what is in front of them. And everyone's going to have a path of least resistance. And I very much believe that my whole pole career was based on following a path of least resistance. Maybe the only thing in my life that I didn't white knuckle, right? Maybe that's why pole has stayed in my life this whole time. Because even at the beginning, it was never about, I need that move. I need to do this thing on stage. I need to have this move. You know, there, are, there have always been things that did not feel right to me. But just like everyone, there have always been things that, that I've tried. You know, like even at the top of my game in you know, 2012, 2013, where we would have pole jams. And we would, you know, try different things and you'd put some your body into something and say, you know what, that just doesn't feel good. It feels weird. I feel a little scared about that. You know what, that one's for you. Let's move on to the next. There are always so many, there is so much you can do on the pole. You don't mm-hmm. even have to go up it. There's so many pole tricks. I mean, you got to find out what is a path of least resistance for you. I never banged my head against the wall being like, I need to get this one move. I was really uh-huh. never that polar. That's and good. I think that has helped me a lot um, right. now in this phase in my life, because again, you know, there are moves that even, even when I was, you know, c- you know, competing that I didn't do, you know, I never did the Gennaro. I never did, you know, um, you know, rainbow Marchenko. I never did all that crazy backbend stuff. And you know what? I did just fine. I'm fine. I- I'm okay. Mm-hmm. I was still able to put on fantastic performances because it has nothing to do with what you're not putting on stage. Like, the repetition of the stuff that feels good and feels right in your body. There's nothing wrong with like sticking with that stick, letting pole tell you where to go next. Right. You know, not saying, Oh my gosh, I have to get this. I have to get that. Or, you know, my students saying, Oh my gosh, I have to get the invert. And I'm like, really, do you like, you can actually take this class without having an invert. Right. Like there are several ways to get upside down. Let's talk about those. Yeah, Yeah. You know, so Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that it's really something to remember that, you know, even, even professional pollers, there are things that we decide not to do and some things that we decide to work hard for and other things that we just go with the flow and, and our styles have been created because we went with the flow. We follow the path of least resistance. You can get really, really good at the stuff that feels really, really good on your body. And then that becomes you know, um, then you, that becomes innovation because now mm. all of a sudden these things that feel so good on your body, you're starting to play with and you're starting to mess with, you know? So I think, I think that has, that mindset has helped me yeah. being in this season of my life. There definitely was a period where I wanted to do everything. I, I know exactly the period you're talking about because I was <laughs> definitely went through that as well. I just wanted to be able to do everything. So I was back bending, I was doing splits and I was like, I want to try and work towards freaking like you know this contortion move but I also want to do this strength move but I also want to do the split move and I just realized that actually something had to give at some point because it just couldn't do it all my body didn't like it and um I just realized when I injured my back which was actually just before the pandemic um 
And my back just didn't like it. My back just did not like it. And I was really one-sided. And I would, at the time, I didn't realize the importance of training both sides, especially for flexibility. And for anyone listening to this, don't just stretch one side of your back because fuck me, it really screws your hips up. Um, yeah, and as a result of that, I'm paying the price now. Well, not so much now because I've done I've done a lot of work to get my back better, but it's still it's still not what it was. I mean, I remember when I used to be able to just like, you know, I remember back in the day when I could just sleep on the sofa. There was no problem at all. You know what I mean? Like now, oh my God, if I haven't got my like proper pillow and I'm not on like a proper bed, oh God, I'm a nightmare. I'm a right old man now. But, hey, so sorry to interrupt your episode. I just wanted to come on real quickly and tell you about the sponsor for this week's podcast. And this week is sponsored by Pole Active. Pole Active are a US-based one-stop shop for everything you need for pole dancing. And I'm literally looking at the website now. And this shop, I've never seen the shop with so much choice in my life. It is crazy. They've got all sorts of things clothing-wise for pole dancing. They've got accessories for pole dancing. They've got shoes for pole dancing, a range of brands on there some of these brands i've never even heard of before and i'm learning about them purely from this website so if you want to go and find out about lots of different pole brands go and check out pole active let's get back to the podcast i want to i want to go back to something we were talking about earlier um the pandemic so we are obviously just after your baby was born probably what was that about six months maybe afterwards we went into all of our lockdowns and stuff. How did the pandemic look for you? How did you get through that period? Um, it was really hard because losing my community and losing like my schedule, losing being able to go in and teach and share what I love. Um, you know, and it was just a whole shift. I mean, for many people, it was just a whole big shift. I, I definitely fell out of shape the most right when that like right when the, well, I, what I tried to do, I was, I got into actually, man, it was at that time that my daughter was waking up like every one to two hours. So I was getting zero sleep. I also went really hard in trying to save my business by doing online classes. So I was teaching, you know, like, you know, nine class, nine online classes a week, breastfeeding every couple hours, yeah, on zero sleep. So it was, it was a really rough time. Um, I was doing a lot of, you know, I had choreography with her in a backpack in my back. And, um, yeah, I went hard. I went hard and I really burned out hard. So after, I think I kept up the online classes for a few months and then we had to lose, then we had to give up our space. So that was really rough. And then, you know, something happened in Santa Rosa right after that happened. I moved um, some stage poles outside to one of my friend's yards, and I was teaching some privates in the backyard. And then the fires in Santa Rosa hit, and um. we, had, we couldn't breathe the air outside. And my friend's place with my poles almost burned down. Like three of the houses in her neighborhood burned down. So I had like then ashes all over my stage poles the air quality you couldn't be inside because of covid you couldn't be outside because of the fires it was it was really something and then i just kind of went okay the universe is telling me to shut it down like forget it i have really really tried to keep this going in, in the studio before we lost the space outside after we lost the space and the universe is saying no nah, you can't do this anymore so um so then we shut it down and it was, it was down for a while. And at that point I was just working with free weights outside in the morning. Ugh, it was rough. I was, I was hardly sleeping and also waking up at five in the morning to, to try to fit in workouts. And it was, yeah, it was a real hard time for me. I was definitely going through a lot of emotional turmoil. Um, you know, my relationship at the time was falling apart. Um, so <laughs> I had oh, a you tiny still, baby. You were, you were still together at this point when the pandemic yeah. started. I really uh, think the pandemic was like a, a firm push into really accelerated so much change in life for so many people. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it was, it, I think it was really during that time that I kind of could clearly see I was, you know, that everything had been taken away from me and I really needed the support. 
I was having, you know, postpartum stuff. I was, you know, losing the studio. It, you know, it was, it was a lot and I needed support at that time. And I, and I didn't see it come through. And I know that everyone was having a hard time, but I think that was like a big, huge part of my decision-making process, having a very, very young child um, at the time and needing a village and it just not being there. And then my partner not being, you know what I mean? So I think it was a lot. um, But uh, the survivor, the manic person that I am, This is when I went full force into learning a whole new skill. So this is when my online business was born. (laughs) Okay, so this is when the online, so this is the the beginner online platform for beginner pole dancers. Yes, yes. What was really getting to me is that, you know, I was taking phone calls for the studio and getting phone calls from people and my, my intermediate advance were saying, oh, can I take your class? And I was like, yes, you can take it online. Yes, you can take it online. But I was getting tons of phone calls from beginners who had never taken pole before asking, hey, can I come train? Can I come learn to pole dance? And for the first time in my life, since 2011, since when I opened my studio, for the first time I was on the phone and I, and I literally had no answer for them. Can I please train at the studio? Can I please come and will you please train me? Can I please give you my money? And I was like, no, no, you can't, right? And that really freaked me out. I did not like that, right? I did not like not being able to share what was just so at my core and intrinsically to share. And that's how the beginner, um, the, the Pole Dance Foundations was born. And I said, I have to be able to give these beginners something that they can do where they can learn at home not continue their pole training at home, but that they can actually learn to do this at home without me right now because we are closed and I cannot, I don't have a studio to train them at. So that's where the Pole Dance Foundations was born. And it really brought me back to, okay, what is it that I would want everyone who stepped up to the pole for the very, very first time in their life? What would I want their experience to be? Where, what is the the information they need to know at the beginning um, what is the information that's going to keep them going and keep them coming back and create and have them create their own personal relationship to pole dancing mm-hmm. that is not just tricks and that is super accessible for them to do at home by themselves. So this was all about having a live community, having monthly coaching calls that they could do with me as their coach, um, having a community where they could cheer each other on um, and not just one side of pole, but what I think every beginner should have from the very beginning, not when they get to intermediate, but they should be having three plates spinning because you got the only way you can find out what your style is and, and have pole be super accessible right at the beginning of your journey is to have three plates spinning. And that is your trick technique. Sure. But also your free dance flow and your dance movement. And all three of those things have to be introduced at the very, very beginning. How many times have you heard Someone say, oh, I tried pull. It was too hard. It Mm. hurts my heart because I'm like, wait a minute. No, did they have you climb on your first? Like, no, 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 no. There is a whole world of pole that is accessible to you right now. And that includes the dance movement and the free dance flow and spinning Mm -hmm. all those plates at the same time as developing your strength and trick technique. That's what will keep you coming back. That's what will keep you getting those pings of, of dopamine where you are excelling, um, and able to really figure out what your own style is. What kind of mixture of those three things do you enjoy? I mean, you, you mm-hmm. can be a pole dancer and never go up the pole not once. Right. You know, you can be a pole dancer and, you know, not freestyle at all. You can be mm-hmm. a pole dancer who has any combination of those three things. So that's kind of really like where that was born. And I went manically into making sure that that was done. So I learned a ton. I took a ton of courses on how to put together courses and learn new software and um, create a platform in which um, all of those different uh, forms of support were available to those students. So yeah, so you you know what? Pivot, pivot, pivot. (laughs) With with that course, did you, is it like a pre-recorded course that you made? Yeah, so it has a, it has modules that people can work through self-paced. 
Um, but it also has monthly coaching calls with me. So it's me. It's, uh, it's, okay. oh, it's that real hands on. Cause I think with beginners, you can't just give them a bunch of videos and say, good luck. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's true. You know, with beginners, you really need to be present with them. And so I really wanted that to be the experience. So they have access to me as their coach all the time. I mean, they send and, me videos, I send them back, you know. And you um, give them advice the on like where to buy their polls and stuff and all that sort of thing from. Exactly. So this is yeah, literally so brand that new, born. never pole dance before people. Yeah, I, that, that was my um, intention. But okay. over yeah. but over the last, how many years has it been since the pandemic? Over the last two to three years, it's really interesting um, how how many people I tried to convince not to take the program who were intermediate pole dancers, but who insisted to take it and then stayed for a very long time and of still doing the program. So that told to me that there was a need. There was a mm -hmm. need to go back and fill gaps in people's training that mm -hmm. people were, were craving to kind of start at the beginning again and make sure that they did have all three of those things, the free dance flow, the trick technique and the dance movement. And that's where the beginner pole dance summer was born was yeah. seeing that need, seeing all these intermediates and high begin high beginner levels say, well, I really want to go back and learn this information. Cause I, I found myself just really taking a lot of intermediates and saying, Whoa, 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 let's go way back. Wait, we don't have that move. We need this move before we do that move. And that's my experience yeah. as a teacher too, at the studio is having to really backtrack on a lot of people's training and saying, wait a minute, we need to go way back and make sure that you have all of these things first. So it's really kind of um, like my signature stuff where it's like, you need all this stuff to get to where you want to go. So let's focus on this stuff. So what, what sort of stuff are you talking about? And I only ask this because I, I have a slightly different view on that topic. So what sort of stuff do you say they, they have to have this before they can do that kind of thing? Yeah. So I really think that, um, um, and you'll probably know this about me too, but I don't think pole dance is just an acrobatic sport. Like for me, mm -hmm. it is, there's so much more to be done with that. You know, um, mm -hmm. I mean, my love affair with the lower half of the pole is absolutely evident, I'm sure. <laughs> um, yes. But I think, you know, um, basic movement, basic dance movement around the pole. How many times have I worked with even advanced professional competitors that I had to, and when I was helping them choreograph their pieces or coaching them for competition, where I had to say, you know what? Y you need to know how to do a drag turn. Like, let's mm. come here. Let me show you how to do a proper drag turn. And let me show you how you can dance that drag turn and get the most bang for your buck without working harder, better, stronger, faster. Let's slow down and let's work on the aesthetic of the movement um, and learn how to move on the balls of our feet. You know, right. learn how to move around the base of the pole. Understand the so push pull of the base of the pole without even going up. More like a dance um, element. You're kind of giving the dance... Because you very your style for me is very much about that stylized movement. It's probably a nice way to word it. You know, that's like you said, a step turn or a, a drag turn or whatever you're calling it. Like, there's so many different ways you can do one, right? And I think that's kind of where you really stick out for me is your your movement quality. Is that something that comes from your dance background? Do you think that's where that's been drilled in from? Um, I think, yes, I, th I think that I was, I was choreographing and creating movement, um, since I was like, since I was like, I mean, since I was a super tiny child, but I was even like choreographing and dancing my own movement on stage when I was like nine, 10, 11. So I have like, I do have like a, I think a major awareness of the connection between body and aesthetic and what you see and what you feel. And how to, I kind of, when I, when I describe it to my students, it's like, I know the smoke and mirrors of this. Yeah. I know how to make this look better without making it harder. Mm -hmm. So it's not cheating. It's just awareness. Right? right. And I like to give my beginners that opportunity. Not only that, but once they have those basic dance movements around the pole, how they can start to begin to put them together right at the beginning, all by themselves. 
right? Mm -hmm. So giving them a, a, like a literal map on how to take these things that are accessible today, how you can make them 10 times more beautiful right now without being, without needing to, you know, to condition for six months to get it, right? There are, you know, the trick technique, that's how that works. It takes time and repetition. And that's one of the plates that we're spinning. But the other plates mm -hmm. that we're spinning are dance movement, quality of movement, range of motion, um, contrast, um, and also free dance flow, how you can take, you know, the first three steps that I teach you and know how to free dance without me. Like I can turn on a song and you can do it all by yourself because I think that as a gift for beginners is huge, right? So for them to be able to already be able to access the free dance side of things, even when they are, have been pole dancing for one week, like that yeah. is what's going to make them keep coming back. Mm -hmm. That is what's going to make them keep getting encouraged to then say, Ooh, I want the pole sit because now I want to put the pole sit into my free dance of repertoire that I already have as a week year old polar. You know what I mean? So I think that a lot, and so I think a lot of it has to do with how do I think someone is going to get those wins along the way? Because the wins at the very beginning of someone's career is gonna what is gonna keep you moving this way. Mm. If you don't have those wins right away, then there's a lot of people who turn away from pole immediately because it's too hard. Yeah, right, and that yeah. just breaks my heart because it's like, what's too hard? Like. Well, that's not I guess your that fault. Also that it's too hard, you know. Yeah, it does also depend on what sort of studio you've gone to, right? Because obviously, it might be too hard at that sports studio where it's like pole fitness right. tricks only studio. But sometimes you can go to a you know a dance based studio where they don't really do tricks, you know. So actually, yeah, the problem is, I guess that students don't know that. So when they go to a studio, yeah. they realize, oh, it was so hard. It's like, okay, did you try anywhere else? No, of course they didn't, because they just assume that's what it's like everywhere. The same way, I guess, that I have probably falsely assumed that if I go and learn salsa in one place, it's probably the same in the other place. But actually, it probably is completely different because it's a different teaching style. And maybe it's the same for salsa where, you know, they have some people who are doing like more beginner style stuff and are focusing more on quality movement rather than trying to make you amazing straight away. So it really depends what studio you walk into the door of, I think, as to whether you're going to get that experience or not. But yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying though. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it's wonderful because it's like <clears throat> one of the reasons why I think that I've stuck with pole for so long is that it's not just one thing. Right. Like some days I feel like going to the studio and putting on eight inch heels and bad bitching around, you know, some days that's who I need to be. And some yeah. days all I want to do is do contemporary movement around the base of the pole. And other days, all I want to do is work trick work and like be up at the top and figuring out this next, you know, this, this trick that I really want to get and see if I can do a really cool transition from this, that, whatever. But I am all those people. It's right. not just like I am one of those people. I, you know, and, and that's how I feel even like as a beginner, beginners, a lot of times their, their experiences, they go in and they're begin they're, it's all focused on tricks and they're feeling like, ah, I'm a failure. Right, I'm a failure. Right. I'm not getting this. I'm not getting this. I'm not getting this. It's like, <laughs> wait a minute, we're going to work the trick technique, but we're going to, in one, in one class, in one sitting, we're going to work all three. We're going to mm -hmm. work your upright hip hold. We're also going to do free dance practice and work. And we're also going to teach you three new dance movements so that you can use those in your free dance. And yeah. now that trick, that one or two, you know, one or two, a trick or that trick combo that they're working on is not the only thing they are exposed to. It's not the uh -huh. only thing that they can walk away from class going, wow, I really didn't get that, you know, but it's yeah. prefaced with, <laughs> Hey, I'm going to show you the technique of this trick. This is about exposure. This part of pole takes time. Let's also make sure you get your free dance pings. Let's also make sure you get a couple pieces of new dance movement today. So you can walk away saying, wow, I am fully, I have been fully immersed. I understand that the trick part of this is, 
is, is something that comes with time and exposure. Mm. I need to expose my skin to it. I need to come back to it. And the way that you set that up mindset wise for a beginner is so important. And, and you were telling me um, at the beginning that because it is for beginners, you do recommend them where to get their poles and stuff from. Out of interest, I've noticed just recently you've been doing a lot of work with Loop It. And I know because I did one of your interviews that are through Loop It Pole, right? How did you yeah. become um, sort of like in a working relationship with Loop It? Because I know before that, were you a representative for X Pole? Did I get that wrong at one point? Yeah, I was. Yes. Yeah, I was. Oh, mm-hmm. come on, spill some tea then. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, drama. Like, I know, right? <laughs> but no, I mean, obviously, I, I you know, there's probably no bad blood there. But, I mean, what no. um, what is it about Loop It that made you decide to sort of change over to Loop It? Yeah, so um, so I was working with x for a long time, loved working with them. Um, I had met Loop It... I would believe I met them at a competition or I met them. Um, it was Who an did event. You meet? Um, it, was it his talk? Uh, I met his talk and Yanni. Ah, okay, nice. Um, yeah, I met his talk and Yanni, and I met them, I believe it, it was at a competition I was judging in Florida. Um, it, was a, it was a competition run by, um, it was in Jacksonville. And, um, <clears throat> I remember talking with them and talking with them about their product and going to um, their presentations and um, at this kind of summit, this in-person summit. And I just got talking to them and they were, you know, they were a small business and they were really asking me questions how would you improve a product? Like how, what do you, what would you like to see in a poll? Like, and all this stuff. And I just kind of went, they are taking notes Mm -hmm. at exactly what I'm asking for. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was telling them, yeah, this nickel thing is kind of crazy. It's not okay. A lot of people are getting, you know, hurt by the, by the nickel allergies on, on Chrome poles. Um, Cause there's none of theirs have nickel in them, right? No. No, so yeah. even their chrome pole is is a safe one to um, to to dance on without getting allergies. That's so, <clears throat> yeah, and and at that time that was a big issue. It was a really big issue, um, and I was worried. I had a lot of fellow teachers, fellow friends, fellow touring artists, fellow students were really having trouble with that. And, um, loop it kind of came in and they said, okay, how can this be fixed? What is it that you need? What do you see a spin mechanism looking like? You know, and just the, the attentiveness of Mm. wanting to know what the dancers needed was huge for me. I, they were, they were, we're having conversations immediately about how can we improve? How can we make this exactly what your community and what you want to see? And being listened to in that way so nice. attentively was really what got me. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say it was really funny because at first I remember seeing them and thinking, mm, okay, new pole company, I've always used x Never was never really interested. x is definitely a market leader in the UK because they're in the UK. Um, still really love my x but I've got, again, I've got students who are allergic to nickel, which is a bit annoying. Um and we and I like to use Chrome, and I don't want to. It's that whole thing of I don't want to change two poles, for example, to stainless steel, because then it means that you know I've got four poles which are Chrome, and then only two that are stainless steel. So then, what if everyone's like, "Well, I want the stainless steel one." So it's like I want to try and keep them all Chrome. So that's what we've always been used to. But it'd just be great to have them without nickel. And then I went to an event last year actually in Croatia. It was a pole camp. And they'd done the most, um, I mean, Lupit worked with this pole camp in Croatia and they um done the most amazing pole setup I'd ever seen. They'd done like an indoor pole room with like powder coated poles, the black powder coat poles, their, um, their well, chrome poles, stainless steel poles. So it was kind of like one of everything. They'd bought their crash mats for us to use. They'd bought their lollipop poles for us to use. They'd set up, no word of a lie, on the beach, they'd set up a, like, outdoor pole area, which was done with rigging, 
really nice tall poles. We had the sea behind us. It was so oh picturesque. Gosh. I'm actually super excited to go back there this year. Um, yeah, and it was just, I remember just thinking, wow, like these poles were actually really good. I mean, don't get me wrong, some of them were brass, and I didn't really love those, but that's not just their brass poles. I'm not a mega fan of brass anyway. I don't like the way it me feels. Me neither. <laughs> it just doesn't feel good for me. I think they're better for humid countries. I feel like in humid countries, they're probably very good. Um, but yeah, for me, they're not my favorite. I've always just been chrome. Me neither. Always prefer chrome. But yeah, I remember seeing that and I thought, wow, like they've done an amazing job here. And I really liked kind of the mechanisms they had for tail spin. So I thought, oh, I was like, okay. I maybe need to take a little bit of notice here, actually, because I think whatever they're doing, they're doing a really good job by this bit. Yeah, so I am. Um, yeah, I'm a bit of a convert. I still love X-Pol as well. I still use x poles at my studio, and I don't work with x pol but I did used to. Um, and I just don't really like to associate myself with one or the other. But, yeah, I mean, they're definitely a contender for sure. I think they're a little bit more expensive for us to buy here. I don't know. Is it the same in the U.S.? Are they a bit more expensive? I think maybe with shipping it can be a little – challenging although i think right. they're they're really getting it together I, you know what i mean I, I think they're i'm not sure if they have a u.s warehouse at this point or something but um yeah it's it's getting pretty it's pretty easy to get a loop pole in the u.s and they, um, you know it's they've got their own factories and stuff haven't they so they make all of them themselves I think so. which i think is like oh amazing. yeah yeah, yeah. They, right exactly yeah, they cause... don't outsource their production Mm-hmm. That is talk. I had his talk on this um, podcast actually, and um, it was really intriguing to see how important quality is to them. And I, I was really like taken back by it because I think with, especially when it's sort of like a guy just setting up a pole dancing company to sell poles, sort of thinking, "Oh God, here we go. This is just a guy who wants to make some money off the pole industry." But actually, it, I think he really cares. Actually, I really like oh, him. Yeah. I, yeah, I was really, I was really surprised. They really, really nice do guy. care. Mm. Um, yeah and I was able to have that relationship with them from the beginning I think we had first talked in Florida and then they had invited me to come out because I was going to be touring um, Europe like soon after that and they said stop by come see our factory come see us you know and in Slovenia and I did and what I saw and what I you know was just as you're saying like it was all homegrown stuff they didn't outsource any of their production you know, all of their employees, they're like, they know everyone's families, like it, yeah. they care, they care, and they care to listen, you know, even to this day, I mean, I talk to them, you know, I know, like once a month, at least, or maybe two times a month, where, where they're just checking in with me, how is everything right. going? How are your polls at the studio? What, what, what do we need? You know, where do you think we're falling short? What do we need to be working on next? What, That's what so is working? Good. What's not working? And like having that kind of communication where they are really asking the dancers, um, is so valuable. Yeah, I definitely think it's. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> I totally just knocked something over. <laughs> um, no, I definitely. I can't I definitely see you, but I hope is... you're okay. <laughs> oh yeah, it's fine. It was just the light. Um, I definitely think it is super valuable. I think it's super important, and it's nice to have a company that is listening. I just, um, yeah. it's not that Expo don't listen, by the way, <laughs> in case anyone's listening to this thinking that Expo don't listen. No, they do. Um, <laughs> it's just obviously, it's nice that it's very homegrown. It's very family orientated. I've always really liked that about them. So yeah, no, I, I definitely really, really enjoyed having a chat with him. Um, before we finish though, I just want to um, talk about your experience with competing and stuff whether that's something you'd ever see in your future, um, whether you enjoyed the experience, just kind of want to go over really over competing with you. Because I know you do a course about how to create a routine uh, competition piece. So before you tell us a bit about it, I kind of wanted you to tell me a little bit about your competing experience and stuff. Yeah. So as far as my competition experience, I loved it. I loved every moment of it. I had a great time. I also came in with, um, like I think I had mentioned before, I only really competed because my friends were competing. To be totally honest with you, it was all inspired by my friend Mary Kolosinski, who was already competing. Um, and her and I were such fat, like we just were just the biggest pole buddies. We wanted to hang out all the time and pole dance together all the time. 
Um, she was one of my first pole idols. I remember first seeing her. What's her, her name? Um, Mary Kolosinski. She's no, she's not, she's not polling right now. Okay. But um, y yeah, but she's. I mean, if you want to look her up on YouTube, I mean, she's one of she's one of my favorite pole dancers of all time. Okay, and cool. when we came across each other and we lived in Los Angeles together, and we first kind of met each other and hung out and pole danced together, I was kind of super starstruck and. It was so funny. I came up to her. I remember coming up to her and I was like, I am such a fan of yours. And she was like, I'm such a fan of yours. Like we should hang out. Like, you know, so then we started pole dancing, get pole dancing together and we became such good friends. All we wanted to do was pole dance together all the time. Um, and you know, I was coming from, you know, um, you know, coming from background of, of theater and dance. And really for me, it was just, I wanted to put these stories on stage and back then the only place that you could put your pole routines on stage were in competitions. Right. That was really the only place to like showcase. There weren't performances happening in pole at that time. Um, so really Mary and I, we would train for competition together. We'd coach each other, you know, um, she would coach me. I would coach her. We'd be putting together these routines, just being so nerdy about trying to create these amazing experiences and tell these stories on stage. And uh, we compete against each other. <laughs> we would compete in the same competition against each other, but we would train our whole training. We would do with each other and we would coach each other. That's and amazing. that was just the coolest experience ever. Um, we had a couple, like our, our kind of core group was, Mary Kolosinski, Catherine Voorhees, Jennifer Kim, and myself. And we would like train all together. Jennifer Kim, that name rings a bell. Yeah. Does she still do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And the four of what? us would train together. We'd all work on routines at the same time in the same space at my studio, the Vertitude Los Angeles. Um, and it was a beautiful experience because, you know, pole is such a unique thing. I remember we would come to trainings and pole trainings together and say, Oh my gosh, Catherine, you have to try this move. This is totally a Catherine move. I bet you could nail this. And it'd be like, yeah. Ooh, Jen, I heard something in this song that I think, so we were really working for each other and mm -hmm. in this beautiful creative space of, um, lifting each other up. And that's what training at the Vertitoid Los Angeles became is just a bunch. And I, and, and it was really, um, those jams that I had at the Vertitude Los Angeles back in the day, I mean, those were jams like we would often have, you know, Nadia and Sasha and Natasha Wang, like all of us, we would be in the space together, all working together, all training together. I mean, I really feel like those are just like the golden days, the you golden know what I mean? Like we, <laughs> yeah, like we were just lifting each other up and mm. we were all competing against each other too, just nice. but we weren't. Because we were all coaching each other and all helping each other, and were you all it was different great. styles? Exactly, exactly. Right. Everyone is so unique in their abilities. You know, we would come to pole jams and rehearsals with a whole list of ideas for each other. <laughs> mm -hmm. Crazy. You know, and it, it was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah. We had a great. So it wasn't a competitive time. environment really so much. It was more like training together. And competing together, yeah. just having fun. I feel I, like the pole industry though, yeah. has changed a lot in the sense that, like, like you said, competing back then was so different. It was so different, and people don't really understand. We were all buddies. About that's it. why, right? <laughs> and that's the thing. We're all and buddies actually, that trained together to begin with. A lot of us had to train in the same studio normally anyway because we didn't have many studios back when I started. You know, so me and others would be training in the same studio because we had nowhere else. We couldn't segregate ourselves and be competitive really. You know, don't get me wrong, obviously there were chances to train our own if we wanted to, but it just felt like it wasn't as competitive back then. Um Agreed. listen, I'm super conscious of time and I've also got a class that starts in like 10 minutes, but that's okay. Um, I want you to tell me before we finish a little bit about this competition. Uh, it's like a competition prep course you do. Yes. Um, so it's actually, it's called pull routine concept creator and it's mm -hmm. actually for anyone who's creating a routine. It doesn't have to be competition. It's for p performance mm. or competition. And um, I just found myself as a, 
coach for competitors and a coach for performers, just repeating myself over and over and over again. And they're just this, being this real core of information um, and uh, that, that people needed to know to put on their best performances. And I said, you know what, that's it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to record it. So I make sure that I have all this. So instead of someone taking, you know, 17 privates with me to get where they needed to get, I could be like, look, do this program do this. when you're done with this, come back to me and then we can do three privates and we're good. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Right, Sorry. Right. I, think my, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that my, um, my, my battery doesn't go out. Hold one second. Yeah. So really what that was about. was um doing so much um doing so much repetition when it came to working with students and clients creating their performances whether it be their first poll performance or whether we're doing it for showcase or competition and how to move an audience because that skill is different from mm. how to pole dance <laughs> yeah and <laughs> right tell and us where can they access all of this, this course? Is it all in like a link in your bio on Instagram or something? Or? Yeah, you can find it all in link in bio on my Instagram. In fact, um, there are two free workshops um, on, if you go to my link in bio on Instagram, and one of them is um, a beginner workshop, a beginner training. Mm -hmm. And the other one is a how to create compelling performances every single time full performances every single time. And that's another free workshop as well. So if you just go to my link and buy, you can take both of those free classes and kind of get a taste of what it's like to be, um, uh, in that pole routine concept creator. So it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a 45 minute to an hour training on, nice. um, what creates good performances. Um, you know, why it's important to have a concept, how a concept moves an audience, how to create a character that's likable, um, how to mm -hmm. deal with props, how to deal with setting the stage, creating a story, when to tell the story, how to map your music, how to, um, um, how to pull out pieces in the music to work for you. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I actually did a blog on this and I, I remember saying at the end of the blog, I was like, I'm going to create like uh, some one day I'm going to create a like a what I basically like a course of what I normally do pre-competition of all the things exactly. I prepare to exactly what you need to do because you're so right like you just end up repeating it over and over again don't you yeah yeah <laughs> that's I mean okay. with, I, that's really what it is is people would say I want to do I want to get ready for competition with you and I'd be like okay well this is either going to be you know a lot of money for you or a little money for you. <laughs> so right, exactly. how, if you want to work with me, how would you want to do this? And then, and, uh, you know, like, like I wanted this to be like, learn the lingo so that we can communicate. You know right. what I mean? There's a lot of times mm -hmm. where people come into privates and I'll start going and I'll be like, Oof, now I got to teach you what that even means. Whereas I I like love if you had this basis of information and then we could go, like we could get it done. You know? Well, I've got this thing with competition training now where I'm always saying to people, people message me, kind of, oh, I really want to just book in a private so you can help me with my competition routine. I'm like, mm. I'm like, well, no, I, I can't do that. I can't help you with a competition routine in one session. It's just not possible. We yes. don't know each other. You don't know how I work. I don't know how you work. I don't know what you can do. So sure, I mean, we might be able to make a little bit of a section of it maybe, um, and that will be quite right. difficult because, again, we've not worked together. Whereas if it's a student exactly. I've worked with many, many times before, then of course it's super easy. But when it's someone who's like, oh, can I come down for a private? I just want some help making a competition routine. I'm like, no. So I do it more as like a coaching thing now where people will pay like a set price for however many sessions and they get that co that coaching because I feel like it's part of it isn't it so important because you just can't there isn't one way to really just be like yeah go ahead and do this and you'll be all good no I need to be exactly. looking at it I need to see are you doing your run-throughs I need to know where is it going wrong where do we need to change there's, there's just so much to it but um listen and I, everyone's loved, so unique oh, you know like well, you have to the, you have to cater that performance to them and, and that's, that's the problem. And it's, it's trying to cater it to people who are so different. And, and then people want you to do it in one session. I'm like, we can't, we can't really do that. <laughs> yeah. That, the, that, that uh, course is all about like, do this homework first 
Cause right. like you're either going to meet with me and I'm going to, we're going to spend an hour talking about what homework you need to do <laughs> uh -huh. or exactly. you can do the homework first and then we can meet and then we can like really like knock it out, you know? that part yeah exactly um listen yeah. thank you so much for coming on i could we could have spoken for ages i'm so sorry i have to cut this <laughs> off a little bit short but um no tell worries. me where everyone can find your stuff what's your instagram handle what's your website where can everyone find you yeah so i think the best place to finally uh, find me is probably my instagram it's at sergia louise s-e-r-g-i-a l-o-u-i-s-e I usually keep um all my links up to date there i also have um the beginner pole dancer summit um, is an event that I run and that can be found at beginner pole dancer Um, we are going to be running another one of those in September. Um, so the wait list page is up. So, um, be sure to check that out. But again, all of those links can be found at my Instagram bio. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. And I hope we'll get to see each other at some point soon, but until then, <laughs> bye. Yeah. Bye Dan. Mwah. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. You know, I'm always looking for different guests to come onto this show. So if you've got someone that you want to hear from, drop me a DM and let me know who you want to see on here next. And until next time, bye. That was all the tea that you can get this week. Join me next time right here. It's the weekly tea.